Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to Celebrate with L.A. Williams. My name is L.A. Williams, and I'm so excited to bring to you this very special episode. Today, we are celebrating the one and only Mr. Robert O'Hara. Robert, thank you for being here. How you doing, my friend? Thank you. I'm doing very well. Great to be here. <laughs> um, so before I jump into the actual conversation, Robert, I want to take a few seconds to talk about what Celebrate is and what it means to me, if that's all right with you. So this series, this moment um, is a manifestation of a, a moment I had as a, as a very young theater student at Alabama State University. It was my first semester on campus, first time going to the theater building to see a show. And it was a play called Phaedra by John Racine. It was directed by Professor Dr. Tommy Stewart. And it was one of those experiences where I was completely taken over by the theater. I was like, oh my God, what is this? What is, I wanna spend the rest of my life doing this on stage. And um, it was, I was truly bitten by the bug, as they say. But the other thing that happened was that I remember feeling an overwhelming need to find everybody involved in that production and say thank you to them. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for giving me something to hope for and look to and all the things. Um, and that was truly, when I think about it, the genesis of what is now Celebrate. Cut to some years later, I'm living in New York City. And I truly have this divine inspiration one summer to start this interview platform where I sit down with some of those artists whose work has really inspired me and kind of listen to them talk about their journey and, you know, some of the moments in their life that sort of shifted something in them and made them want to be an artist and all that good stuff. Um, and 10 years later, I'm still doing these conversations, still having these conversations. And as you know, we're in this pandemic, we're living through war, we're living through a whole lot of stuff right now. Um, but even still, people are out there making work. And I decided to go out and see work um, starting last fall. And I'm glad I did, Robert, because as always, the work is just so uplifting. It's so inspiring. It's so good. And what I, one of the shows I recently saw a couple months ago, I think not even, yeah, just a couple weeks ago, whew, was your production, Robert, of Long Day's Journey in Tonight. Mm. Ooh, sweet God. Um, and I'm so glad I got to see it. But before I, I, we, we get into Long Days, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, I want to start off by saying why this conversation with you means so much to me. The first experience that I can really remember feeling like, oh, my God, Robert O'Hara is a genius <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is actually when I saw your play in production of Booty Candy. Oh, Robert. Oh, God. Jesus Christ. Child, you wrote that play and you directed the dog meat out of it. And I remember thinking, having the same feeling, Robert, I had as a young theater student at Alabama State. Who the hell put this together? How do I find him and say thank you? And I've been wanting to say thank you to you in this way ever since. And you may not remember, but I'll never forget um, <laughs> accosting you after Booty Candy in the lobby. <laughs> And you no, were like, okay. and you were like, okay, it's great. It's fine. And I was like, oh my God, I was doing my thing because I was so full. Um, and so I just wanted to start there, not to mention all your other work that I've read and seen over the years, um, including Long Day's Journey, which you directed the dog meat out of, <laughs> Robert. I mean, what a stunning, stunning, haunting production um, of a masterwork that you did masterfully and made it so much better than it really is. Let's just talk about it, but we're not gonna go there, right? Um, um, so I just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to hold space for you. I wanted to let you know that I love you and I appreciate you. And there's so many things that I'm gonna say to you throughout this conversation um, in terms of just like my gratitude for you. But I, that's why I invited you to here today. And I wanted to celebrate you. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me. As I said, I'm very happy to be here. I also love that you, um, prefaces by saying that there was a, a play by the title of uh, Phaedra as if it's not one of the most famous plays. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? I know, I know. Well, some people be looking at me like, I'm sorry, who? I've never <laughs> been talking about. Um, so that that is hilarious. You're right. It is absolutely a very famous play. Um, that's true. Um, so listen, the way I like to start these celebrate conversations off is by celebrating the day you were born, the day you entered on this earth. Um, and that idea is meant to have you take us back to wherever you want us to go to however far back you want us to go and talk to us about your birth story your early years upbringing anything you want us to know i don't actually uh it's so weird because i think that especially in my family my grandmother had 12 kids mm. and my mother was the oldest child mm. i was the oldest daughter mm. 
And so therefore she, uh, when I was born and she was a teenager, she was, uh, I think 17 when she got pregnant with me, mm-hmm. um, that I was one of the older cousins because mm-hmm. she was one of the older daughters. But mm-hmm. my mother, I, I, I remember asking her about um, my conception and what have you. And, and she said to me, and I think I was 40 when I asked her this because mm-hmm. I told me didn't really talk about those things, but mm-hmm. She said to me, um, well, you know, I don't really know how you got here because me and your father never really did anything. Mm. And I'm like, well, y'all did something. She's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, because I don't remember doing anything with your father. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? And she was like, that was the first time that she had had sex. And then I was conceived. And so mm. it was, she considered it a, a virgin birth because she was mm. a virgin when she had sex and then she had mm. a child. And I mm. sort of, and I look at pictures of myself as a little boy mm. and it really a little baby with my mother, mm. the few that, is, that I could find. Mm. And she looks completely and totally like out of her mind, like completely <laughs> into like, what the hell? <laughs> like, how did I end up with this right here? I mean, it, yeah. it really is like someone who's been like devastated mm. that uh, mm-hmm. that now she has a child. And mind you, she had, you know, 11 other siblings and being the older uh, oldest girl, she mm. pretty much took care of many of them. Mm. But having her own child, it just looks like a person completely and totally unprepared mm. um, to be a mother. And I always say, you know, I have a younger brother, but I say that, you know, the, the first, the second born gets a parent, the mm-hmm. first born gets somebody who had a child. <laughs> and so, she didn't know what that what a mother was or what mm. a parent was. Mm. My brother knew what a parent because she'd already been a parent to me. But I just yeah. got a woman who had a baby, mm. and she was 17, mm. 18 years old, mm. and so uh, and, and in a family that is like a huge family. So that to me sort of like encapsulates sort of like my coming into the world into a huge family to a woman who was wholly unprepared, uh, 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 had a relationship with her boyfriend who after that was not her boyfriend anymore. Mm. Um, mm. And, and says to their 40 year old child, um, I don't know how you got here because I me and your father never really did anything. So it's both <laughs> hilarious and tragic and ridiculous at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh, you, oh, thank you for that. That's so, um, mm, I hear that. Um, so you have a younger brother. Were you the only child? I mean, obviously you just said you have a younger, were y'all the only two is what I mean to ask. Yes. And what was it like sort of growing up in the house with you, your mom and your brother and all that stuff? Just like everyday oh. life. Well, I was an only child for six years, but I, mm. as I said, my grandmother had 12 kids, so I had a lot of family mm. around me, and my mother was mm-hmm. young, so, you know, uh, my grandparents had to take care of me when she went off to work and what have you, mm-hmm. and so growing up, uh, and when my brother was born, I was six, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and so I really didn't know what this creature was, like, what was <laughs> happening, why were you here in my, <laughs> sharing my mother, um, and so it was a, a very sort of, uh, I would go over to my grandparents' house, uh, mm. and I remember going to school for my grandparents' house, and then my mother would pick me up on the weekends or whatever we would spend, uh, like, I, I would go home. It was constantly going back and forth between my, my mother and my grandmother's house, and then I think mm. when I got into the third grade, I started going to school closer to my, my home where I, with my mom and my little mm. brother, um, mm. And so it was like that for, I think, another six years. And then my mother married, my, who is now my stepfather, mm-hmm. uh, and I was 12. And so mm-hmm. and we moved into his house. And the crazy thing is that he had two kids from two previous marriages, or I think mm-hmm. relationships or what have you, that mm-hmm. one was my age and one was my brother's age. Oh, wow. So we literally moved into his house where his other two kids were mm-hmm. already had been moved out because they were mm-hmm. with their mother. Mm-hmm. So we moved this to somebody's house and it was a very strange mm-hmm. event moving mm-hmm. into someone else's house who also mm-hmm. had kids our age. And so they mm-hmm. became my stepbrothers, right? Mm-hmm. So it was a real, a really strange negotiation as to whose house, why are we in this man's house? And it took me some time to go, oh, he's not leaving and we're not leaving. We're gonna be here for a while, right? <laughs> be so here for that, a while. And, and, and also, for the first 12 years, the formative years, not having a, 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 a father figure. I knew my father, my father would come around every now and then, but I didn't mm. really have a father figure that, to all of a sudden sort of being thrust into this man's house mm. and being like, he's an authority figure to me. It was like, mm. ah, because at 12, you're sort of like, I, I, I sort of had formed my idea about my identity in a way mm-hmm. and who I was listening to. And I grew up in a very sort of female centric family mm-hmm. and the women were really, you know, in control. 
mm-hmm. of most of my comings and goings and whatever. So mm-hmm. to have this man in the middle of here uh, was very strange uh, mm-hmm. and awkward, mm-hmm. especially as a queer child as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that was uh, an interesting negotiation. Wow. Ooh. Robert, where did you grow up? Where were you born? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm. and uh, I escaped at 18, as I always say, uh, <laughs> to, to Boston, and then mm. I escaped four years from there to New York, and I've been stuck mm-hmm. here this whole time. But mm. um, I always think of Cincinnati as like a wonderful place to sort of like grow up when you don't know what the hell's going on around you, mm-hmm. uh, and that, you know, a lot of people, Cincinnati prides himself on being sort of on the north but you like i always say if you can see the south then you're in the south that's right and you, and you can see kentucky across the river ohio yes, river you can. so yes, you, you can. know you in the south whether you that's think right. that you're in the north or not but also there's a lot of migrate the great migration and many uh, black people migrated from from the south to places like cincinnati chicago you know mm-hmm. those places so my grandparents migrated up uh, mm-hmm. And then it began having a bunch of their, their kids in Cincinnati. So it was this really sort of interesting combination of Northern and Southern. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and and also the sort of, so racism played in many ways, very subtly and then blatantly at times. But as a mm-hmm. kid, you're sort of protected some, mostly because I was around my family members most of the time. But going mm-hmm. back to Cincinnati, I'm just like, I, did I grow up here? This place is mm-hmm. really, really different than what mm-hmm. I remember it mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. child. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so good. Um, was there an event that happened in your sort of first 12 years of being in Cincinnati that you remember that sort of Cincinnati was known for or um, that was sort of big uh, nationally or just something like a big sort of transformative event that took place in your young childhood that you can recall? I don't, you know, I know that there were things that had happened but I don't, I, I vaguely, and I, I'm probably getting the dates wrong, but I do remember something, uh, 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 and it's a fact that uh, the Maplethorpe scandal, uh, mm-hmm. his, his pictures were being presented at one of the museums mm-hmm. and they were supposed to be pornographic or whatever. And I don't know what age I was. I really mm-hmm. don't even know if I was still in Cincinnati, but, mm-hmm. it, but in my psyche as a grown mm-hmm. adult now, I sense that that event had something that resonated with me mm-hmm. because I knew also embedded in the conversation was homosexuality, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was m- men, was cocks, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. even though I didn't know exactly what it was, and I think, mm-hmm. you know, after this, I'll probably research and find out that I was like 35 years old, or whatever. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but I do remember there being the controversy of that. Mm-hmm. So I think that was a, a major event. And I think, um, I guess, Another major event uh, for me was sort of like musical, uh, finding my um, my theatrical, uh, uh, starting my theatrical journey, and mm-hmm. that my uh, uh, family. I had a lot of brothers. I, mean, I had a lot of uh, cousins, mm-hmm. and we would always go over to my grandmother's house, who has a huge house, and mm-hmm. and there was <clears throat> all this sort of like storytelling that mm-hmm. I would put together, and we would put mm-hmm. on stories in the backyard and make up mm-hmm. plays, make up mm-hmm. music. Mm. So there was a lot of imagination that was being mm. sparked from mm. just hanging out around family members, uh, mm. Um, mm. which was exciting to me. Mm-hmm. You mentioned queerness, your queerness, and I'm curious to hear you talk about when did you know you were a queer person? Was it very early or was it much later? And how did that sort of show up in your everyday interactions with your family, your cousins, oh. everybody? Like, Well, I, you know, I... I I don't think the word was in my sort of vocabulary Mm -hmm, until mm -hmm. adulthood. Mm -hmm. I knew I was different. Mm -hmm. I knew that my uncles who, because my, once again, my mother was the oldest um, daughter, most of my uncles and aunts were teenagers when I was Mm -hmm. growing up. Right. Right. Be brutal to Mm -hmm. little kids. Yes. Yes. And so I was called, I can remember being called faggot on a regular basis by Mm. my uncles on a regular basis, but all manner. And I didn't really know what, that really meant. I knew it meant that I wasn't doing something that other boys did, or I wasn't participating in a way that other boys did. Mm. I also knew I had a, a, a different type of interest in boys mm. than uh, other people did. I didn't play sport. I could care less about playing sports or, mm-hmm. or doing certain, I didn't play with dolls either. I read books. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And so I did, but also I, 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 I know I, uh, I, I, 
peed in the bed. I, I mm-hmm. wet the bed mm-hmm. so way into my teens. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. now so that I know that something was connected to that and, mm-hmm. and the sort of abuse, uh, verbal mm-hmm. abuse. But once again, I label that, that these were teenagers, many of them yes, became were. juvenile were. delinquents. Yeah. Exactly. You know? uh, and, and so, and the odd thing was that, you know, it always felt to me that the sort of homophobic slurs got more and more uh, uh, um, vicious whenever mm. one of my uncles would return from jail or from mm. being incarcerated mm. or something. Mm. And so as an adult realizing sort of like the activity that is condoned or mm-hmm. that happens in jail and then the sort of shame that happens mm-hmm. after getting out of jail for certain things may have played into their relationship mm. to having this young nephew mm-hmm. who sort of either reminded them of their behavior or uh, place some sort of fear of, as to what they were or what they were doing. But I do remember it being something that, and they wouldn't say it oddly enough, they didn't say it around my mother and they mm. didn't say it around their sisters or my mm. grandmother. Mm. But, you know, they would get me in different places and find me around corners or whatever mm. and say the most vicious things uh, to me as a little boy. And so I created this sort of tough skin. I had a, you know, a loud mouth. I had a quick wit and I could give a damn about what they were saying. And mm. I think that was part of my protection mm. uh, around mm. that. Yeah. Ooh, Robert. Oh, child, you are sending me right now. Oh my God. Um, that resonates on a very deep level. Um, oh Jesus. Okay, let me see if there's anything else I want to tease out from that because that's so juicy. Um, I, I guess the question that's swirling around in my mind is other than your own self-protection, do you recall there being any other sort of outside protection from your stepfather, from your brother, from, I mean, he was so much younger than you, but, you know, I mean, even though, like you said, it was mostly just happening to you and no one else got to really see it. But I wonder, did you ever feel a sense of like, I know I can go to Uncle Sam or grandma. I mean, was there anybody? Well, only because it was just, you know, to me, it didn't have any weight to it mm-hmm. because there was okay. no uh, ramifications on you calling me that. You were just right. being an asshole to me. Right, right. As, as you've it. always been an asshole right. and that you're right. an asshole to everybody. Mm-hmm. I, it was manifest to me as mm-hmm. faggot. It probably was mm-hmm. manifest to other cousins as something mm-hmm. else, mm-hmm. right? Uh, mm-hmm. But I, my, my solace was school. Mm-hmm, and my solace mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. reading and, and my solace was my own imagination. I, I would daydream a lot. And my mother hey, was worried after a time that I was daydreaming too much. Yeah. She would come into the room and I'd be you know, I'd be daydreaming. And she'd be like, what's going on? What's wrong? What, what are you thinking about? Um, but I always had, I, I, I sort of, I guess I ran into my imagination. Hey, hey, God. And I kept my imagination a place that was safe for me. And mm. school allowed me and, and, and being sort of like in advanced classes and being pushed forward and being told that you were smart allowed me a, a place to retreat. Yeah. And, and a, but, but it was also an incredibly giving and warm upbringing. You know, mm. that you mm. always are going to have assholes because that's I didn't right. get to pick my family members. Um, I think something happened. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I, so it's, uh, I, I say that while being fully traumatized as a child, mm-hmm. but as an adult, having some degree of awareness as to where that was coming from and sort Absolutely. of, you know, teenage boys and sort of mm-hmm. how they were mm-hmm. really basically projecting totally yes uh, fears and many yes. of them probably had participated in homosexual activities that i knew nothing about there you go that's I'm right yes fighter. that's right yes <laughs> so, right exactly um so i i think that uh i i actually enjoy i have to say i really did enjoy my 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 childhood although i spent every waking moment trying to figure out how i'm going to get out of here get out you know, of it. Wow. i knew there was more to my life and that hmm. cincinnati and and i think every child sort of figures out like what else, what is the opposite of where I am now? Uh-huh, and uh-huh. that's what I want to be, you know, mm-hmm. and what I want. So I was, I was obsessed with trying to, waiting for my exit so that I could reinvent myself and live inside fully. But school and plays and drama mm-hmm. and the imagination mm-hmm. and my grandmother, mm-hmm. who was a very important person to me. Um, and I think, she, uh, you know, a lot of people with grandmothers, you know, they, it's that person that, you know, does not have, the same level of judgment that's right as your parents do mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and also uh, somehow are very happy when you act out because you know now you're putting it to their child as their child put 
had done to them in a way. That's right. <laughs> so there's something slightly sinister also. That's right. That's about right. What grandparents let you get away with when they know they wouldn't That's, let their own children get away. That is so freaking accurate. Um, you talked about, um, you just mentioned performing arts. I'm curious to hear you um, talk about when did you know that you were an artist? Did Was there a seminal moment? Did you like, ha- were you in a cafeteria play at school in eighth grade or something like that? Like, when did you know, oh God, I'm an artist and I want to be in the theater? Well, you know, I didn't actually think of artistry, uh, art as anything other than extracurricular or hobby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I didn't think of it as a profession, but mm-hmm. I knew I was an artistic person from very mm-hmm. early on. Mm-hmm. I, as I said, mm-hmm. I was writing things and putting on plays with my cousins. But I do remember the one time uh, and the very first time that I had I, I decided that I was going to write something. Mm-hmm. And I wrote this thing and I went to my sixth grade teacher and, I, you mm-hmm. know, you have a sixth grade sort of project or, or production or whatever. And I mm-hmm. said, to her, you know, I wrote a play. <clears throat> And I'm wondering if we might be considered to do it for the sixth grade project. And she's like, what is it? And I said, well, it's this play that I wrote and it's called, uh, it's an adaptation of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's called Ebony and the Seven Cool Cats. (laughs) In my elementary school, there in my sixth grade class, there was one white boy. Everybody Mm. else was black. Black, okay. Right. and I was in the sort of college preparatory section of the sixth grade. Mm. And so uh, I guess that sort of led me to having the audacity to think <laughs> that I should present this to a teacher. And I think she was a math teacher, but she was my homeroom teacher also. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so they read it and they let us do it. And mm. so it was the strangest thing because of course, in this play, which I have no record of actually, that I know of, someone I'm sure has it, um, but it had embedded in there when Snow White or Ebony as my character looked in the mirror and says, who's the fairest of all, Diana Ross's song, Mirror, Mirror came on. <laughs> and a whole number was on. And that was written into the script. And mm-hmm. I'm like, so if you didn't know you were a homosexual then, <laughs> then something was wrong. Right? Something was wrong. <laughs> something was off. Because I, that's the idea of being in this <clears throat> and 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 putting in Diana Ross's Mirror, Mirror, Mm. Uh, and having someone lip sync to it, um, <laughs> a queen or whoever, um, yeah, <laughs> lip sync to a princess is so outrageous. And, mm. and also, but the idea of like, oh, I don't have any white people in uh, mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. in 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 this, this class, so I'm mm-hmm. changing this to the people who I know, and that's they're going right. to, and she's going to be Ebony, and they're going to be the Seven Cool Cats. Right? I love, and the I seven think cool I directed cats. it or co-directed it with my teacher or whatever. <laughs> but the audacity, I think it was that mm-hmm. moment really. Mm where someone mm. actually said, oh yeah, this is not just a project in your backyard of your grandmother's house, mm. but other people enjoy the work outside of your family. Mm. Uh, and I, I sort of knew that it was something that I pursue. But I, mm. once again, I never thought of it as a, a profession. I thought I was mm-hmm. gonna be a lawyer. And, mm-hmm. have, and I also, of course, thought I was straight. You know, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm, even mm-hmm. knowing that you're different, you right. still believe that somehow you're gonna be in, in, <laughs> all right in the rest of the world. I and know heterosexual even right, though exactly. you're looking at boys and you know mm-hmm. you're fantasizing about boys mm-hmm. the mind says this this is not right That's and right. therefore your life will work itself out just as soon as you get out from under all this other stuff hey! you'll find your heterosexual self oh that's yeah. so true that is so true how the mind yes absolutely Robert, moving forward, um, did you go to like a fancy performing arts high school or did you go to a regular high school? Like what was high school like for you? I went to a college preparatory, preparatory high school. So you, okay. everyone in the city had to take a test. Okay. And then you, uh, the people who passed this test could opt to go to this college preparatory uh, high school. Uh, okay. and, uh, and that's when I sort of like engaged fully uh, with white people. Mm. Now I had white people around me all the time because most of my <laughs> teachers were white. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but as but when in my I think my fourth and the fifth and sixth grade, I was in a public school and in this neighborhood, um, uh, it just put that the white there were not a lot of white kids mm. in the school. But mm-hmm. so when I so when I tested out and when I tested into the sort of college preparatory school, which was for the citywide uh, mm-hmm. uh, test, I entered into a world of uh, lots and lots and lots of of white people. Mm. Uh, and so it was an academic school, but you know, like any place, there was 
people who didn't have an ounce of brain power at all <laughs> and who would just happen to pass a test. Right. right. So <laughs> even inside this academically advanced high school there were also then double a courses mm -hmm. advanced courses you know mm -hmm. so there was mm -hmm. so i i knew then that this idea of standardized testing for people as mm -hmm. some sort of you know barometer of intelligence mm -hmm. was bullshit mm -hmm. Bullshit. You know, I know yes. people who are completely stupid that got into Harvard. That's and right. I was like, you know what? You the dumbest person I know. How you get into Harvard? <laughs> yeah. So education has always been a sort of like, you know, mm. false promise mm. to me. And that mm. somehow because I'm educated, that somehow that means something. Mm. Uh, and my grandmother had a sixth grade education. And I, mm -hmm. you know, and she had more vocabulary and made up more words than I've ever heard. So That's right. I, you know, I've always had a very particular relationship to education and I think mm. I'm overeducated, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I, I put it in its place that there are certain people who are, over, who are educated and have no common sense at all. Mm -hmm. Come on yeah. now. So Ooh. that's how I look at it. Ooh, Robert, Ooh, thank you for that. Um, so after high school, you mentioned at 18, you escaped. Let's talk yeah. about the escape. Where did you go? What did you do? Well, you know, I, this was before, like my parents were not getting up and taking trips to go visit colleges. Mm -hmm. Right. That wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, all I knew is that I had to leave. I had to get out. And I remember telling myself and telling my mother and stepfather, wherever I go, it's going to take y'all a good while to get there. Y'all <laughs> not just going to be able to show up. Right? I wanted to be on a coast uh -huh. or someplace where you had to plan your trip <laughs> to get there. Um, and I had enough warning. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, this is also the time where, you know, they didn't have, it was, there was no internet. Right. Mm -hmm. So what they had was these, I think, uh, beta uh, VHS, VHS mm -hmm. tapes or these mm -hmm. clips or whatever mm -hmm. videos mm -hmm. of colleges, campuses, and like they would do mm -hmm. introduction of videos and whatever. So I remember seeing in brochures, seeing this thing uh, um, about a place uh, in uh, Massachusetts, and there were a couple of places in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, my teacher said, well, my counselor, because I had a high school counselor, and she was like, I think you should try to think about uh, Tufts or uh, um, there was another school, Williams or, mm -hmm. um, uh, or maybe Hostra or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And I said, like, but what about Harvard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was like, and I think you should try and think about Tufts mm -hmm. or, or Williams, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I looked at the brochure of Tufts and I was like, oh, this looks interesting. This is very, this is exciting. And also it's far enough away mm -hmm. that my parents <laughs> really have to plan. <laughs> so, you know, me escaping was literally mm. uh, a never visiting the campus, mm. getting in, uh, mm. um, in, in into this college, getting all this information about financial aid or whatever. And mm. then my family packing up and driving across the country to watch to, uh, to um, um, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I don't even <clears throat> think that they spent the night like mm. I, I think that like I was dropped off and moved into my room mm. and I came downstairs and they were like getting in the car mm. and I was like mm. off to orientation I just really mm. have this image of my parents like driving away mm. um, but there was no like you know um, well this is what college is going to be like because my parents didn't go to college right. um, and so it was really sort of like my sort of like saying i'm i'm done with cincinnati mm -hmm. I, I love you all i had always done a lot of theater in cincinnati and in college i mean in high school mm -hmm. uh and i was always in musicals and stuff mm -hmm. you know, in the drama club mm -hmm. and had a lot of sort of um extracurricular activity and i so i knew a lot of people in mm -hmm. high school but i didn't have a lot of friends and i was incredibly mm -hmm. lonely mm -hmm. right because, and i realized mm -hmm. that i had been putting things to do and, and and being involved with a bunch of stuff so that I could actually have something to do over lunch break. Mm. Uh, and then I realized one day that I actually never ate lunch with anybody because I didn't really feel like I had, and I had friends, but mm -hmm. I didn't really feel like they were my lunchroom friends or my, mm. that sort of way. And, mm -hmm. and their friends were other friends, whatever. but I was really well known because I was mm. in plays. Mm -hmm. And so I realized when I was going to college, I was like, I really want to invest in meeting people and, and getting close friendships and mm. i think it also has to do with like i did not want anyone to know my secret which mm. was that i liked boys mm. right and even as i continue to live inside this world in which i'm going to be a lawyer mm -hmm. i'm going to have two kids named oliver and oliver mm -hmm. and olivia mm -hmm. and i'm going to have a wonderful marriage mm -hmm. i knew there was something different about me and i think mm -hmm. that kept me away 
from mm. making real um, connections. Mm. Although all of my friends, I'm sure, knew I was homosexual. Sure. And in yeah. fact, one of my best friends turned out to be a homosexual. Mm -hmm. But there was always a loneliness mm. to me in high mm. school. Mm. And I think I felt a little bit more of myself when I didn't have to pack myself back up and mm. take myself back to my house and back mm -hmm. into my family. Yeah, right? God. And I yes. could sort of like say, this is who I am. And this is all you know about me because I just got here and you just got here, right? Yes. Hey, God, yes, yeah. There was yeah. something wonderful about that. Thank and you for that, Robert. Predominantly yeah. white, a predominantly white campus. I mean, that comes with a whole other group of problems, you know, Child. in the Northeast. You, know. you and I have a, um, two really big connections. One, we're both from Ohio. I'm from Cleveland. And two, mm. we both went to college in Boston. Mm. Um, and we're black and we're queer and all the things. Um, and there, and listening to you now, I'm like, oh shit, we got a whole lot more in common, but that's a whole nother thing for another day. Um, but the thing that I'm sort of getting at Robert is I wanted to hear you talk about what exactly were you escaping? And you just, I think you just touched on it. I think you just touched on it. Um, um, when you were at Tufts, you got to Tufts. I love this idea of, oh, not having to, to fold yourself back up in order to go home, that you got to sort of not do that for more hours in a day by just kind of just being who you, I just love it all. Um, my question is, what did you study at Tufts? And what was it like for you being a young black boy from Ohio in Boston at that time? Ooh, Jesus. Child. It was so, once again, it's when you're in it, it's different than when you go back and you go, wait a second, I was here. So for mm -hmm. me, Boston was a, uh, you know, was a closed campus on a hill. A Tufts mm. was a closed campus mm -hmm. on a hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't really, and then all the people around it were called town <clears throat> counties, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a very elite group of people, mm -hmm. uh, a campus. And so I really didn't interact with the rest of Boston and know just how racist and how segregated it was. Right, yes. Because that's I right. was just in college for four years. Right, so, yeah. But I studied <clears throat> political science when I got there. Mm -hmm. You know, the freshman year, you don't have to actually decide what you're going to do. But mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, I'll do political science. And I remember taking a political science class and I was like, oh, I'm not reading all these books. Are y'all? I'm, I'm not doing any of this. None of it. None of it. <laughs> so uh, I was like, no, I, uh, and I remember that giving me a Frankenstein book, uh, mm. uh, the book of Frankenstein for a political mm. science class. I'm like, oh, well, I'll read this because I hadn't read it in my literature class in high school. So I read the book. I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll be an English major. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then I went to the English class and I was like, oh, I'm not reading all these books. <laughs> like that was like, out, I was like, that's not happening. not happening. And then I was like, oh, but I have all these credits in drama already because mm -hmm. drama was always a, a sort of like the electives I had mm -hmm. been doing. Right, right, right. yeah. Uh, and so I realized I had like done a shit ton of electives mm -hmm. and they were all dramas. And I was mm -hmm. in the, the plays mm -hmm. there and I was part of the, I started the Black Theater Company with Heather mm -hmm. Sims, who mm -hmm. I met my uh, freshman year. Oh my God. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was, I was a theatrical boy, but I was still thinking, oh, no, this is not a profession. It's, My profession right. is going to be something real and something that is connected to heterosexuality. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Talk about in it. In some strange mm -hmm. way. Uh, right. And that I would ha still have a family and kids. It was like the most ridiculous. It was the most ridiculous thing. Um, mm. And so uh, then I started to uh, I concentrate on drama mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that sort of and I had a teacher a chair of the department looked at me after uh, one of my productions of a play that I had written. And he said, I think uh, you're a playwright. And he goes, I don't know if you're a director, mm. but I know you're a playwright. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time anyone said that to me, that there was a profession mm. called playwright, mm. right? And, and so, I, and I had always been writing. I was always mm. writing plays, always mm -hmm. writing stuff. Uh, but I didn't know it was a profession. Profession, uh, yeah. And then, uh, or that anyone, I didn't know anybody that was going to school for playwriting, right. you know, yeah. just, yeah. especially not Black people going to right. undergraduate right. for yeah. playwriting. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> I also was a director and I and I loved directing and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. came from being one of the oldest grandchildren and having a bunch of younger kids, younger than me, and sort of getting them, giving them something to do um, mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and creating. And so <clears throat> I started to take directing classes in undergraduate, and then mm -hmm. I left uh, and, and applied. I didn't leave, but I applied for Columbia's directing program mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and their playwriting program. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That was my way into the profession. Oh my God. Did you go directly into grad school after? I did go directly into grad school. And Columbia, uh, uh, I remember going to my interview um, at Columbia for directing, 
and they said I was one of the top candidates and that I should be hearing from them soon. And I went back to my uh, college and I was like, oh, I'm not coming to this class anymore because I'll, I'll, I'll finish this uh, Spanish class at Columbia because I'm going to mm. Columbia. <laughs> a week later, I get a rejection letter from Columbia for mm. both the playwriting and the directing. Oh. And I was like, uh. <laughs> and I couldn't actually leave my room. Like I was like, traumatized i was in a state mm. of depression i stayed mm. in my room for a week mm. and then i realized i remembered that a, prof, uh, a high school um counselor said if you don't get into a college call up admissions and let them know how much you're interested and maybe they'll put you on the wait list right because mm. everyone can't go to every college they get into that's right yeah and so i called up the chair of the um the directing program and mm. i asked him uh, i said hey he's like hey robert and i was like uh, so I got my rejection, but I thought you said I was one of your top candidates. And he said, um, hold on for a second. And the dean of the school, I think, or maybe the chair mm. of the whole department got on mm. and said, we sent you the wrong letter. Uh. Uh, and that you had definitely got into the directing program. And we hadn't made decisions yet about the playwriting program because it was a mm. dual program that you could do. But you'll be getting your admissions letter from the directing program. And we will find out if you get into the playwriting program soon because we haven't made those decisions. To this day, I have never gotten an acceptance letter uh, from Columbia. All Talk I have is it. a rejection letter. That's and I, right. <laughs> I started getting some financial aid stuff. So I was like, oh, that means I'm in. So I just showed up and mm -hmm. they had me in the records, right? Mm -hmm. So they never got around to sending me an admissions letter uh, for, uh, from Columbia. So, but that's where my MFA is from. So I, I did go directly into that, actually. Robert, I am, okay, pause for two seconds. First of all, let's celebrate the fact that you made that phone call. Eh. Yes. Let's really like acknowledge that phone call that you made and the person, you know, giving you the inspiration to do that. Yes. that. But the other thing that's blowing my fucking mind right now is that I went straight to grad school, which was in Boston from undergrad based on a phone call I made. Eh. Mm. 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 Very interesting. And it was after that two hour phone call with the chair of the performing arts department at Emerson College. He said to me, if you can get me an application in by the middle of next week, I'll consider it. And then I got all my shit together, you know, recommendations. And then um, a couple months later, I got started getting financial aid information. So again, it's, it's wild. Yes. Um, and I love that you acknowledge that you never got that acceptance letter. So it leads me to wonder. It just leaves me to wonder. I'm gonna leave it at that, but that's right. juicy. And I never got the seventh letter and I never, and so I entered into the directing program. And the crazy thing is that at the end of my three years there, um, I won the best playwriting uh, award uh, for my play Insurrection. Yes. And, and no one knew that I was a playwright because I hadn't mm. gotten into the playwriting program. Mm. <laughs> so mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. the plays were like, wait a second, you wrote a play? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I've always been a playwright. And I did my thesis as mm. uh, 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 I wrote my own thesis, which was Insurrection, and it won the mm. Best Play Award. So mm. it was this strange, strange, weird, surreal uh, world uh, mm. of graduate school, and uh, it was the early uh, 90s, mm. and um, they were just finding themselves as a program also. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it was a very, I, I just remember like in, uh, I think in my first semester, uh, at the end of the first semester in like, I guess, December, um, mm -hmm. the chair set me down and mm -hmm. was like, well, the consensus among uh, your teachers, your professors, that you're a little bit too focused on um, uh, homosexual issues and African American issues. And I'm looking at him like, mm -hmm. this is a white man sitting fully up in the middle of his office in Harlem, mm -hmm. right? Telling his only <laughs> black queer mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a student that I'm too focused on African American issues and uh, homosexual issues, and mm -hmm. that I need to broaden my scope. And I was just thinking, and I just started laughing. He was like, mm -hmm. "Why are you laughing?" And I was like, "I just think this is wild." Did you tell my colleague from before that she's too focused on German expressionism and feminist ideas? Come on now, come on. Did you say that to her, mm -hmm. or are you just mm -hmm. saying it to me? Because mm -hmm. we're fully sitting inside Harlem, and you're telling your only black <laughs> right that I'm too focused on who, who I am in my mm -hmm. work. Oh. Um, and so I just started laughing, um, mm -hmm. and it was like it was constantly surreal experiences mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think that sort of also led me into writing my uh, play, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is about a Columbia student in mm -hmm. graduate school mm -hmm. who goes back in time and mm -hmm. uh, falls in love. Um, mm -hmm. so it was a really sort of wild 
uh, a ride at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Thank you for talking about the surrealism of it all, Robert. Yeah. And just how the it, every other moment is so surreal. You're like, is this really actually fucking happening? Well, you're in an, an institution. It means that you're in an institution. That's right. You know what I mean? And yes, there are certain right. institutions that we put people in because they need to be taken care of. And that's there are right. certain institutions that we go into willingly and we <laughs> lose our entire mind. Yes. Right? We lose our entire mind. <laughs> it's like, oh, I did willingly walk into this institution. So I guess I did. And we're paying them. And we're paying them. To make us lose our entire To mind. make us lose our fucking mind and yeah. like institutionalize us. Yes. Isn't that wild, the programming? Right. Oh, God. It is wild. And then you come outside and it's like, I don't think that people really give uh, credence to the fact that you are stepping out into the real world and you have just left an institution. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody out here waiting for you. Mm -hmm, Ain't nobody mm -hmm. out here giving you opportunities. You mm -hmm. thought because you got the leads in this institution or that mm -hmm. you got an opportunity in this institution that somehow the world was waiting for you to give you those opportunities. And you get out here and they go, no, uh, guess what? No, and I have other things to say, no, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where you thought you were gonna be, but we have been out here a, a, a while. We have not exactly. been waiting for you to, you don't need another exactly. director or playwright or actor to that's come right. out of an that's institution. Right. That's right. You've already been here. So that's right. Welcome, you know, welcome. Uh, and that's the world that you get. In. It puts you into this bubble where mm -hmm. you and, and I saw such, you know, desperation and pettiness and that inside of an decision. Oh, I got to have that part. Or I got to do that play. Mm -hmm. This is what I really mm -hmm. want to work mm -hmm. on. And this is a, and people getting really emotionally attached mm -hmm. to this make believe world. Hey. Right? And then you get out and it's like, oh, yeah. So they're not going to offer me Shakespeare to direct. Mm -hmm. right? I'm mm. not going to be asked to do anything that I want to do here. I'm, mm. I am actually going to have to do something else and then find a way to do what I have been doing for three years inside this institution. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert. It's, it's an anomaly that I think we constantly put ourselves inside of. Yeah. You have become, we become too emotionally attached to this make believe world. Yeah. Ugh. Jesus. Oh my God. It's so true. Everything you just said. I am so conscious of time. I can listen to you, Robert, oh, teach and preach all day for the rest of my life. Um, so, so talking about, speaking of your welcome into the world outside of that institution, what was your welcome into the world? You know, how did you enter into the, and I use quotation marks, professional um, arena as an artist coming out of grad school? What was that like? What did you do? Where did you go? Well, the two things that were seminal to me was my relationship with George C. Wolfe, who was running mm -hmm. the public theater. Mm -hmm. And I started off as an intern there mm -hmm. and ended up being one of his uh, assistants on some mm -hmm. shows he was doing. And then he ended up uh, hiring me as an associate artist. Mm -hmm. And my first play was done. My thesis <clears throat> play then was done at the public theater mm -hmm. uh, a few years after mm -hmm. it was done as my thesis play. Mm -hmm. um, and so George really was the first person to give me an opportunity. Everyone else, and I think for several years after that, put me in a sort of category of being risky mm. and being sort of out there and being mm. sort of like, you know, uh, this, uh, um, you know, Black people being avant-garde is not looked upon the same way as white people being avant-garde. Come on now, talk about it. Yeah, right? it's true. And mm -hmm. so, or, and so <clears throat> now everybody wants risky. Now everybody's yes, putting up do. a banner on their website, risky art, we're challenging right. art and whatever. Right. Back That's then true. it was like, wait a second, is this a black play or a gay play? Mm. Right? And, mm. uh, or is it a history play? And what are, what are you actually saying here? You have to be in mm. one lane or the other. Mm. And, uh, and so a lot of people thought of me as an anomaly, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and mm. that, uh, and, and most people were really sort of invested in, you know, uh, their white supremacist notion of what theater was, mm. right? And that was whatever is going to make the audience comfortable, that's mm. what I'm going to program. Yes. So yeah. I was actually the person that like, you know, that you wouldn't bring home to your parents uh, mm -hmm. and, and my work, uh, mm -hmm. because I wrote a play mm -hmm. about a gay man going back in time and falling in love with a gay slave. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I don't know how to, pro I don't know where to put that in to mm -hmm. any spot. That I wrote. Mm -hmm. First of all, slavery, mm -hmm. second of all, homosexual, time travel, mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. stuff. You know, so George was the first person that said, oh, I think this is brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. let's do it. And he came to see my thesis mm -hmm. uh, uh, at Columbia. So that was my introduction. I also had this very strange and 
every time I think about it, I talk about it, I was like, how did this happen? So after my thesis, I got an agent and as about six months into having this agent, I got a call saying, uh, there's a, a producer who's looking for someone to write a biopic based on Richard Pryor's uh, autobiography. Wow. Uh, about prior convictions. And mm -hmm. I thought that you might be interested because he's gone through all these other known writers and he just doesn't feel like they're right for it. And I thought, mm -hmm. he's like, do you like Richard Pryor? I'm like, um, what? Of exactly. course I like Richard Pryor. Like, like why Richard. people ask you like questions like, <clears throat> oh, do you know who, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, any random black person that every black person should know is, and you're like, uh, yeah, I've been black yeah. my entire life, <laughs> right? So yes, I know who Richard Pryor is, and I and I and I do like his his uh, um, his comedy. So he said, well, why don't you? Um, I'm going to put you in touch with him. And I said, well, wait a second. So I took a little time and I got the book. I read the book and I put together a sort of ten page, mm. uh, ten uh, the first ten pages of a script of a movie. Mm. And it was mm. explicit, it was rated X. Mm. It was like, I didn't have any clue as to how to write uh, mm. a movie, but I wrote it. And then six weeks later, I get a call from my agent saying, so the producer has read it and he gave it to the director who's gonna be doing it and they wanna meet with you and, mm. and, and they wanna meet with you next week. And I'm like, mm. um, what are you talking about? He's like, well, mm. that thing that you wrote that was explicit, they're very excited about and they mm. wanna meet with you. I'm like, well, who's the director? And he says, Marty Scorsese. Mm. And so I ended up sitting in a room with Martin Scorsese uh, oh a week God. later mm. and him saying to me, well, so, you know, <clears throat> what do you need to start this? And I said, mm. money. And he goes, <laughs> well, we got that. And mm. so I ended up I, I, at the end of my thesis time mm. at, in, at Columbia writing a biopic mm. of Richard Pryor for mm. Martin Scorsese. Mm. Right? And, mm. I, and, I, and from that process, I learned a lot that a lot of uh, creativity is used and mm. never produced. Come on now. Right? And so that uh, I made a lot, a very good living for a while off of doing things in the film industry that will never be seen. Uh, be and that these, you know, and when you get to a certain level as a director, you're sort of having 17 different projects and people writing mm -hmm. projects for you all, all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't direct all those things. And That's certain fair. times, you know, the options lapse and whatever. But it was a very good lesson. And because then people started to think of me as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. And yet I was a director of the theater. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I had, and then my play was done. So now I'm a playwright as well. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. actually didn't know what category to put me into mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I couldn't be a fully, a uh, formed person. I had to be either a playwright or a screenwriter or, or director. Mm. I couldn't be all three. A whole person. Right? You couldn't be a whole uh, person. No. <clears throat> and I always equated to like, they wanted me to walk in the room and leave my arm and one leg outside the door. Oh. You know, but mm. not bring my entire body into it. I yeah. have to hey. both yes. my blackness and my sexuality yes. and my history and my family. Yes. And so yes. to tell me if it's a black play or a gay play, I'm like, it's all that and so much more. And so much more that I can't. Hey, God. Yes. Robert, how did you know uh, George C. Wolf? How did he know to come see your thesis? Were, were you the talk of the town at that time? Yeah. Or, no, or no. did you so write him a Columbia, note? Most grad students, grad programs require you to do internships at the end. Okay. To do your okay. thesis and to do Oh, internship. got it. Okay, so got it. At that point, uh, I think one of our professors in the, in the Columbia was general managing uh, Angels it. in America. Got it. And he had just started uh, at the public. And so I wrote him a letter and mm -hmm. said how much I would really love to work with him. Because mm -hmm. of course I had read and been in the Color Museum in college. Right, yeah. And he was the only black gay person in the theater that I knew of. That's right, right? that's right. And I was like, and he's running a major American theater and he's yes. directing the seminal American play. So that's I'm like, right. uh, I'm never ever gonna even get an interview, but he read mm -hmm. it and I, I guess I spoke about myself in whatever way he saw himself in me yes. and, and and so like you know he invited me down for an interview and and the rest is history can i just take a moment robert to celebrate again you writing that note to him him reading the play and responding to it and inviting you to be a part of his team at the public celebrate george c wolf gal i mean yes. let me tell you something i mean let's celebrate this obviously legendary artist and human being. Um, and also, I just want to take two seconds, if I may, to celebrate Heather Alicia Sims, too, who you mentioned earlier. I mean, yes. genius artist. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's that's incredible. So, 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 wow. Oh, God. Speaking of mentorship, I want to just celebrate the fact and say thank you for being a sort of acting mentor in my life um, over these past however many years. 
um, you know, I think it was after Booty Candy that I begged you for a sit down. And I remember we went and had a burger at um, some burger joint in Hell's Kitchen. And, um, and ever since then, Robert, you've been such just a force in my life in terms of someone I can go to, cry to, <laughs> curse to, <laughs> yes. all kinds of moments that we've had. So I just want to say thank you, Robert, from the bottom of my heart, friend, for um, just creating that space for me, recommending me for things that I'll never know that you recommended me for and mm. the things that I do know about. Um, it is so important you know, um, that we have those kinds of relationships in this business, but also, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think that your presence in this community has made my presence a lot more possible and easier. Mm. 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 Well, thank you. Uh, that's um, all so thank you. Do. That's you all know, we can do. All we can do is make a way and that's hope right. that the way has been clear to make it easier. You know, as people walking in a certain direction, you sort of, mm. you make the path a little bit easier. That's like exactly right. Walking in that direction. That's right? exactly right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And 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 also the holding space of it all, which you do yes. for me. Um, uh, okay, listen, I could talk to you forever, but I want to I wanna carve out a moment to simply say, um, thank you again for Long Day's Journey and Tonight, Robert. You directed mm. that show so beautifully and you're the oh i'm first of all i'm haunted by it and the unforgettable performances of that entire cast especially mm -hmm. bill camp and elizabeth marvel let me tell you something elizabeth took me up and threw it <laughs> i felt high okay i left the play thinking i need to go get a drug test child yeah. i felt like i had just come off of some big big sort of you know um thing and so thank you for that stunning stunning production and all your work and congratulations robert let me just take a moment to say congratulations on your tony nomination for your incredible beautiful stunning elegant direction of slave play thank you very much you uh, know and there is a very um is is i i i after not actually you know spending two and a half years almost in a pandemic and then coming back and sort of like remounting slave play and then in long days journey and tonight it's sort of like you know both plays are you know operate in, in such a deep seated uh, mm -hmm. section of trauma mm -hmm. inside uh, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. plays and i think as i always say i'm only actually really invested in uh and in, in characters who have really uh uh interesting problems like i'm not mm. interested in working in plays where with healthy characters mm -hmm, right mm. i'm interested in sort of working out the messiness uh, yeah and both yeah. those plays have a level of mess that's mm -hmm. so incredible and people come to the plays and this is what i was saying to my husband the other night it's like it's really amazing that people will come to a play called slave play and leave and go oh i was offended mm. and i and i i was uncomfortable and mm. i'm like well you walk into a room it's a kind of slave on it. Slave so play, exactly. Into, you know, a picnic basket mm -hmm. and handed it out and made it feel <laughs> like what were you expecting? And <laughs> like how the long day's journey mm -hmm. into night. All mm -hmm. those words should yeah. lead you to believe that this may be some shit that ain't mm -hmm. gonna sit with me just right. That's right. You know That's what right. I mean? So you go into these, it's like going on a roller coaster and go, oh, wait a second. I was a little bit concerned because it went fast. Mm -hmm. And I was a little bit scared because it was really mm -hmm. high up. I'm like, but you walked into a roller coaster. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So I like to actually, you know, mm. acknowledge uh, the fact that, you know, I'm not here to make you comfortable. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and that your comfort is not a part of my reality because no mm. one's in the world making me comfortable mm. come I'm on now experiences mm. and mm. and you can choose to get up or you can choose to to uh to stay but mm. i think that it's very important that so often as artists you know people come in and they think that it's our job mm. to entertain them mm. Uh, mm. And that's right them, and, and and i'm like how can i entertain everybody sitting in this room at the mm. same time. You know mm. what I mean? I can only mm. give you an experience. You can like or not like it. That's right. Um, and so those two per, per, uh, performances, uh, those actors are uh, mm. are so amazing because they have mm. to go out and live inside that. Yes, yes. Over and over and over again. Over and over again. And then yeah. have people go, well, you know what? Um, that was really sad to watch. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, and you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, I, and, I and think you're welcome. That's what uh, I, I sort of live my sort of mm -hmm. do my work by is going, this is the experience. You're welcome. Mm, I love that. I love that. You're welcome. I love that, Robert. 
Um, thank you for your fearlessness, always fearlessness um, in your work and your honesty. I was thinking about this before we got on today. Um, I always feel a sense of fearlessness and honesty and just like directness mm. um, that I can relate to as a boy from Ohio, from the Midwest, mm. um, um, as my own person. So these are just some of the things that I always appreciate and everything about my interactions with you Mm. as well as my interactions with your work. And I don't ever want um, you to think for a second that it's lost on me mm. or any of us, that, that is, those are some of the gifts that you give us, Robert. Um, so thank you. And I celebrate those qualities about you and your work. Um, listen, in the spirit, we're moving, we're almost there, Robert, I promise. In the spirit of lighthearted and fun, um, lightheartedness and fun, um, I'm just curious, like, what are some of your favorite things? Like, just to get to know you better, but also like, What's your favorite city, your favorite food, your favorite song? I mean, just your favorite thing to do, like just light stuff. Uh, you know, most people who really, really, really know me, they know that I'm obsessed with Just Judy. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. I did not know that. Uh, only because I just think it's so outrageous that it's people would outrageous. actually come on television and, <laughs> and, and be as petty as they are. <laughs> and that she, she, she sits there and she is just rude. She and she is. Yeah. And, and, hilarious. and I just love the idea of court, right? And that you're coming in to have this small little white woman <laughs> cuss you out. On cuss television. you out on television in front of the whole world. <laughs> right. So, and just how fake it is. Like, you know, it's not even a court. It's a set that like <laughs> all the settlements are paid by the television show. Yeah. There's yeah. all this other stuff, you know. And so I, I, that's one of my really wonderful uh, obsessions. I also, I, uh, um, I, uh, I love one-on-one -on -one engagements mm. uh, with mm. friends. I love mm. just hanging out in mm. my, uh, at my home uh, mm. with a friend mm. uh, and just mm. talking shit. Mm -hmm, and, uh, mm -hmm. and and having a nice drink and mm -hmm. you know talking about life because I just feel like so much of the conversation around art is about doing it mm -hmm. and being and trying to get an opportunity to do it mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and we have such few uh, conversations about it as a, just a part of our lives mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, and just mm -hmm. what it means to be an artist because we're all mm -hmm. in the struggle and mm. sometimes it's nice just to acknowledge that mm. and to not have to have, especially being a director and being a playwright, to not have all my engagements be about getting a job or giving someone a job mm -hmm. or not having a job, mm -hmm. you know, mm. but it's about what it is to live in a space where mm. other people are in control of whether you eat or not. Mm. Uh, and whether you sort of are able to express your creativity or not. And so one-on-one uh, -on -one engagements, I really, really enjoy, it, whether it be on Zoom or whether it be mm -hmm. in my house or what have you. So those are certain things that I like. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I also, I love uh, being with my husband who is, one, who is my best friend mm -hmm. and he loves theater much more than I do mm -hmm. and wants to do go see mm -hmm. every piece of theater. Mm -hmm. And just engaging mm -hmm. with him on you know because he's not in the in, in the same profession and mm. his thoughts on things and seeing mm. how certain things land with him mm. uh, so that's another thing that i uh, i really love oh god you're about to send me in i love that i love love i love your love with your husband i love it all um and i don't know robert you i'm just gonna say it i feel i know I, we all know that you are one of the most prolific theater artists living today mm. okay let's just put the shit on the table let it be known <laughs> if i haven't said it if ain't nobody told you today i'm telling you here now mm. and it, it is why i'm so deeply honored to have this conversation with you um gosh i just feel so blessed um the way i like to wrap these conversations up is by asking three questions Okay. The first one being, what does it mean to you to be celebrated? I don't, uh, I'm incredibly shy. Mm. So it's, uh, and also I operate backstage. I operate, mm -hmm. one of my goals is simply to not be mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet everything that you see is me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so to be celebrated is, a, a part of being seen mm 
Mm-hmm. And I'm slightly uncomfortable with that mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. I'm not used to being seen in the way. Mm-hmm. I'm, al- I'm used to also uh, when one is celebrated, mm-hmm. uh, uh, usually what comes out of that is a sort of ac- accusation of your worth of being celebrated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can only point you to the Oscars mm-hmm. and right. a celebration and mm-hmm. how that can sort of lead to uh, mm-hmm. uh, a backlash of whether mm-hmm. you should be celebrated. Come so on celebration now. has to me both uh, um, a good and bad thing because I think that, you know, we're all out here doing the same thing, trying to mm-hmm. tell stories and trying mm-hmm. to be interesting, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but I, 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 and it also makes me appreciate mm-hmm. uh, the people who I celebrate mm-hmm. and the people mm-hmm. who, who have walked before me mm-hmm. whose path has made it easier for mm-hmm. me to walk. So mm-hmm. I see it as a celebration of them as well. I love that. I love that. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, which leads me to my second question I like to ask, what or who do you celebrate? Uh, I celebrate um, the ability mm. to continue mm. to walk through life and a black queer body mm-hmm. and not harm myself or others. Hey, God. Uh, so that mm. to me is, is not only a choice, but it is an active uh, uh, work ah! uh, every day of one's life. Yes, God. Uh, because there's so much that is projected on and also so many boxes that you're supposed to be inside of that you sometimes just want to act a fool. You want to act, act a fool out. and act out <laughs> just and just act hurt out. people and just right. The damage, number yeah. of people who did not get run up on mm-hmm. and that who did not get cussed out fully <laughs> in front of everybody and who did not have to put a, a, a restraining order out on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yes. It's a lot of people who are living very blessed lives. <laughs> I need Talk to about it. Not have mm. to go there mm. in every moment of microaggression and every mm. moment of just everyday uh, madness mm. uh, that I think comes with walking in a world that sort of like wants to put you on the other side of the street. Ooh. At the same time, um, uh, uh, see you and uh, tell you that you should be lucky that you are even walking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's that. Uh, Robert, that's so deeply fucking profound. Mm-hmm. The ability to walk through the day without hurting some, come on now. Listen, um, finally, I'd like to ask, oh, that's bringing, that's so emotional for me. Um, what do you do to celebrate you? I think I uh, I try and find laughter mm-hmm. uh, and silliness, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, and mm-hmm. you know, and really sort of like mm-hmm. even in the most chaotic uh, moments, is the uh, I. Uh, I call it um, finding the beauty inside the horror. Mm, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and, and to me, that is a celebration of that I'm not supposed to be here. I, to be 52 and a mm-hmm. Black man and gay, mm-hmm. when we know that mm-hmm. all of the things that have conspired to not mm-hmm. allow us disease, mm-hmm. racism, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, war, uh, uh, drugs, uh, uh, all the stuff that have said statistically, <clears throat> you and I are not supposed to make it past 30. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. If we make it to 30. That's um, right. That for me to find joy and laughter mm-hmm. and being able to say, well, I made it this far. Hey, God. Uh, yes. Is, I think, a celebration of myself. Mm. Mm. Robert, um, Listen, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for reliving um, some of these incredible moments that you shared. And I think I speak for so many people, Robert, when I say we love you so much, we value you, uh, you matter to us so much. Um, 
And we're just, I, I know that we're all so grateful for your presence again and your voice and your work, you know, and all that comes along with you and especially this beautiful journey that you shared. Thank mm-hmm. you and so let's celebrate this journey. I love it. Thank you for doing this with me. Um, thank you for letting me love on you. Um, in this particular way, because um, I know I send you, I cost you with messages all the time about how much <laughs> I love you. You're like, LA, leave me alone. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, thank you for this. And um, yeah, it's just amazing. I'm so full. Great. And thank you for doing this. I think it actually is something that we should do more of uh, mm-hmm. with more people. Uh, mm-hmm. So thank you for, uh, for allowing me the space. Absolutely. Absolutely. My honor, my privilege. Thank you so much, Robert. Love you. Talk to you soon. Love you too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.